All right, I think still I'm still working working on what works best for for uh for this recording with the technology and everything, but I think we're headed on a good track here. Um All right, so how do we feel about the hydroboration reaction, if not the mechanism? The reaction was okay, right? It's anti-Markovnikov. Um, I did go back and look at the um, sin versus anti-addition for the oxymercuration demercuration. Um, it, so the oxymercuration part is um, a sin addition, just like we, we thought it would be. Um, but the, but the demercuration step when you reduce it, apparently that scrambles all the stereochemistry. It must go through some sort of planar intermediate because it doesn't matter what you start with. You're going to get a mixture of sin and anti-addition when it comes to the, the demercuration step. So that means there's just two possible products for. for that. No, it means you're just always going to get if there's two possibilities. If adding it sin versus anti is going to would give you two different products, you'll get both of them. In relatively equal amounts. And I think I misspoke. I believe that one was anti because the first step is it adds, it makes that three sided ring with the mercurinium, the mercurinium, and then your, your nucleophile has to come in from the opposite side. Um, so your, your intermediate. Um, would wind up looking like If our intermediate looks like this, our new nucleophile, whether it's an oxygen or something else, is going to come in here. So it has to come from the opposite side because it's basically like a, an SN2 reaction where you're going to break that, that partial bond between the, the more substituted carbon and the mercury and bring your nucleophile in to make the new bond. And so that would happen from the opposite side, just for steric reasons. So nothing, nothing new really. Anyway, um, but I just wanted to touch base with uh, the, since, since the hydroboration is very specifically only sin, um, because we know the mechanism the whole way through and it, keeps its stereochemistry the whole way through. Uh, I just wanted to go back and talk about the oxymigration one. All right, so here's a cool real world molecule. This is alpha pinene. Alpha pinene is actually responsible for a lot of the, um, well, you could guess from the name um, that you find it in pine resin and sap. And so it's, re it's responsible for a lot of the what you smell when you smell a piney smell. Um, and also interestingly found in lots of pop oils. And so it's also it's why you can expect to, to get some hop varieties will produce a beer that smells a little bit like a pine tree because those hops actually produce measurable amounts of pinene. Um, which, so that's kind of cool. It's a, you'll notice it's a weird structure a little bit compared to what we're used to looking at. Um, this is what's called a bicyclic structure. Not, so we wouldn't usually refer to something that has two fused cycles as bicyclic. So if you can picture having, say, two benzene rings fused, you get a, a structure like that. That's, we call that a fused ring structure. So when you have two rings this sort of in 3D, where they kind of are on top of each other, we call that a bicyclic structure. And if we count the number of carbons in here, have one on each ring, one, two, three, four, five, and six in the back there. 
I'm trying to write too small. It doesn't like that. <laughs> For whatever reason, five is the one that gives me trouble today. Um, so it's basically a hexagon where two of the carbons in the hexagon are attached with another carbon. So if we looked at it um, from the top down, you have something that looked, I'm not gonna mess with the other parts, but if you can, basically we have a, a regular cyclohexane and then car, if we call this carbon one, carbon one is attached to carbon three with another carbon. So it's really like two hex, um, hexagons on top of each other. Cause if we flatten this one out, it made those ones lay down behind the board just by changing our frame of reference a little bit. You could have them, the other one going into the board. Right, and so all this to say that these kind of bicyclic structures, we see them a lot in biology. A um, lot, of, lot of pharmaceuticals have bicyclic structures. Most anything that ends with cane um, as a pharmaceutical is a derivative, meaning they started from the base structure of cocaine. Um, and then they messed with the base structure of cocaine, so they're trying to eliminate negative effects, such as um, it makes you high, it's addictive, short-lived, um, and try to give it other property or ma maximize other favorable properties, like um, it causes numbness. So most most of our the um, not topical but local anesthetics have cane as the, as the ending of their name, Novocaine, Procaine, Benzocaine. Those are all derived from cocaine and all of them are bicyclic structure. And I think most opiates too, for that matter. Most opiates are much larger fused ring structure, but they also have a bicyclic structure component as well. Um, so we see these kind of structures all the time. We're not gonna get into how to name them because like most things that are this complicated, if we actually have a molecule that's common enough that we care for it, care about it, it's going to have a common name. Um, so if we took this alpha pinene and we um, put it through hydroboration followed by reduction or oxidation rather, what product or products are we going to get? We're going to get an alcohol. If it's hydroboration, it's going to it's anti Markovnikov, so that puts it on the less substituted. So that carbon there. And could we predict whether it's going to be what this, the stereochemistry is going to be? Is it going to be up or down based on how that molecule is drawn? And what is it going to be relative to the methyl group? The methyl group be trans with respect to the, the methyl group will be trans with respect to the OH. So we're going to get something that looks like and when even when it's a complicated structure like this, and really actually if you think about it in terms of the way we were drawing our cyclohexanes from before, it really kind of looks a little bit like a chair cyclohexane. With that's also both at the same time. If you, um, so you could start by drawing it like it's in the chair conformer, um, except that it was going to be one, two, three, four, five. So it was planar before. Now it's going to be more of our traditional cyclohexane structure. And then we're going to also have. 
sort of a a double on one side. The other way we can draw it to simplify things is to just flatten that structure out. So think about it like Had that also had two methyls on it. We're going to not worry too much about that side of it, though, because that's not where the reaction is happening, right? So I'm going to erase those two methyls just so we can kind of see what's going on here. Would those two methyls like determine where that third methyl is, um, like the sterics? So that's what's gonna we're gonna talk about here in a second. So our our first product is going to be we're, if we have the methyl up, we have the OH down, or they could be flipped, right? We could have the OH up and the methyl down. So which of, which of those seems more likely based on sterics? Does the methyl have a significantly different size than, than the uh, OH group? Not significantly. The other thing to remember is go back to our our um, axial versus equatorial. If these are axial, they're going to be and they're kind of locked into that position by the fact that they're attached to the other side, right? You can't really put this carbon equatorial, right? So if this one's locked into the axial position. The other one here, this is also, if there's, let's see, work through our regular cyclohexane here. Uh, let me draw. So if we have these ones are axial, One right next to it, if it's trans, it's equatorial. And two carbons away, if it's cis, so here, if this is our big carbon that's attached to the other side of the ring, it's stuck in the axial position. The trans, or sorry, the yeah, the cis position is not going to interact with it. It's the one three diaxial positions that interact with it, right? So here, if it's if the it's trans, they're not going to interact. If it's cis, they're not really going to interact either because it's going to be equatorial. Even if they're both axial, they're pointed in off opposite directions. Here, if it's axial, if it's cis these two can run into each other, right? So it's really the sterics on the third carbon away that dictate. So this is actually fine. It looks like it would be sterically in the way, but because both of them, even though it's cis, one is axial, one's equatorial, so they're not interacting. Here, we want the OH to be trans rather than cis. So does that affect, what, are we still gonna see both products? Yeah, probably, but we're gonna favor the one on the left. It's gonna be our, our primary product.
what changes if it goes through acid catalyzed hydration? On the more substituted carbon with an, an oxygen bigger than a methyl group, but just like we just showed, there's not really gonna be that much steric interaction because it's gonna turn into a cyclohexane, which means one to two, there's not that much. If we had to choose, we probably would put the oxygen in the trans position just because it's lone pairs might bump up, be bumping into the methyl groups there up, that are up high, um, but it's gonna be at equatorial even if it's cis which means those, it's not really going to be that big of a deal. So we've got both products for acid catalyzed hydration. Any, any rearrangement we need to worry about? What would our intermediate look like? Positive charge right there, right? It's already tertiary. So no, no rearrangement to worry about which means we get the same product for oxymercuration, demercuration. The difference with oxymercuration, demercuration, you the sterics will matter a little bit more because you have to add a mercury, which is a pretty giant atom. And so it's going to make sure that it's, the mercury is going to be trans. Right, so that we don't get those one, three diaxial interactions because the mercury gets added back here. And so then the mercury could run into those one, three diaxial inter interactions if it's in the cis configuration, but not if it's in the trans configuration. There's still gonna be some interaction, but this piece up here has two extra methyl groups compared to that one. There's still going to be some sterics slowing things down either way, but it would much rather be, it would much rather be on this side of the ring structure than be running into that. All right, so questions about our three hydration mechanisms. So, so far we've got acid catalyzed bromination, hydrobromination, hydrochlorination, and we have our three hydration mechanisms. So those are our three, our five um, reactions that we have that are addition reactions. And as, as before, as in my other classes, this is one where I make you, I would throw this, this might be the wild card part on a test. It's very unlikely that I would, I would not expect you to be able to go through all of those levels of detail, go all the way back, call back to cyclohexane, axial, diaxial interactions um, on a timed test. A take home part of the test, sure. When you can spend all the time dissecting it, you want, but as you can tell just from watching me go through this, even somebody who's really well versed in this is going to have to stop and dissect this and work their way through the logic. Even if you are a professional chemist, um, you wouldn't be able to know off the top of the head, you would have off the top of your head, you would be able to sit down and go through the logic. So I'm not going to, on a time the situation, I'm not going to give you something that convoluted. Just to reassure you, because I know that that was a lot of, um, stuff we haven't talked about in a while. All right, so let's add another another reaction. Still another addition reaction. Um, this addition reaction is called hydrogenation. So hydration is adding a water molecule. Hydrogenation is adding a hydrogen. Where have you heard that term in everyday life? maybe especially in terms of uh, cooking or in or junk food, partially hydrogenated. partially hydrogenated soybean oil. Soybean oil is naturally a liquid, right? It's naturally di 
dye or tri unsaturated, meaning it has two or three alkene groups in the big long fatty acid chain. Um, if you partially hydrogenate that, you're basically turning it more towards being a saturated fat, um, which is tastes better and it's easier to cook with, it behaves more like butter, um, just vegan butter. Um, but you do have to put it through some chemical process. So it's one of those one of those things where um, it can be you can have vegan butter or you can have natural butter, but you can't really have natural vegan butter. Um, your better bet for that is something like coconut oil, find a naturally occurring saturated fat that occurs in plants. Um, like the vegetable oil is not as healthy because like we don't have enzymes to digest it as well. Or it's, not it's more of a, of a moderation thing. I don't think vegetable oil is particularly bad for you. It's bad for the environment because mostly it comes from corn um, and we need to get away from using corn, only growing corn and soybeans in the U.S. Um, for ecological reasons, less so for, for health reasons as far as I'm aware. Um, I could be off base with that. Um, it's more just like if you have vegetable oil, you tend, you know, you can fry anything in vegetable oil and it tastes better. Um, but I don't think it's particularly, it's vegetable oil is better than frying it in butter, health, or health wise. That's what Chef, you ask it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's the other thing is there's, there's been successive generations that have learned different things nutritionally. Um, but I mean, how many of you learned about the nutrition pyramid in in grade school, right? Um, that's not actually how people should eat. It's designed that way because of the grain industry in the U.S. and the dairy industry in the U.S. have um, basically designed that to benefit themselves, right? So we might know that being science-minded, younger generation, my parents still eat according to the, the health pyramid because that's what they learned in school and that's what was right by God. Um, so, you know, it's, we're still learning a lot about nutrition, especially in humans being such, such com complex systems. Um, I mean, it took them for, if you look at the, uh, they call it the green revolution in the 60s was basically when artificial fertilizer became really, really cheap and widely available. And they started being able to feed the entire planet um, just using chemical fertilizers. It took us another 20 years before we realizing we were still depleting the biological aspects of the soil and that that was still a problem ecologically. We can't just keep dumping just synthetic fertilizer and expect it to work long-term because we're ignoring the biological aspects. So, and that's just soil. You imagine applying the same logic to the way we understand humans and human bodies, and we're still figuring a lot of stuff out. For trans fats, I thought it had something to do with like the it's typically you put under and making. Oh, trans fats. Yes. Trans fats are really bad for you. Is it portion hydrogenated? Or is it just fully hydrogenated if they're trans fats? So if they're partially hydrogenated, um, so trans fats can are made entirely in a lab. They're not even, they don't even need to start from, from um, natural materials. Um, but you actually wind up making trans fats from saturated. You can desaturate fats to make trans fats. And now they're not saturated anymore. So it was from a marketing point of view, it was genius because everybody had heard saturated fats are bad for you, but trans fats are still solid at room temperature. They still taste a lot like butter when you cook stuff in them. Um, the problem is most, Unsaturated fats are cis. So if you have if you have a big, if you have this big long saturated fatty acid chain, looks something like this, where you have, you know, 16 or 18 or 24 carbons in a chain. If you make it unsaturated and it's cis unsaturated, the bond angles are such you get like a kink in the middle of it. Trans fats, though, have almost the same bond angles as tetrahedral carbons. So trans fats would look like that. And so that's why they still are solid at room temperature, why they still taste a lot like a saturated fat. The problem is, is that all naturally occurring 
unsaturated fats are cis unsaturated fats. And so those are the fat, fatty acid chains that our bodies and, and living beings in general have the ability to digest. We have, we have the enzymes that fit that particular shape. Um, we don't have enzymes that can digest trans fats. And so trans fats, when you eat them, if they get those fatty acid chains get incorporated into your body, they're basically there forever because there's no way your body can works by chopping off two carbons at a time when it, when it's breaking down fatty acid chains for, for energy. And when it gets to a trans fat or a trans bond, it just can't break it down. It just stops there. It's stuck. Um, so that's why trans fats are banned. They're not just bad for you. They're illegal almost worldwide at this point. And they've been, they've been phasing them out in the U.S. all the way back to the 90s. I think they just finalized getting rid of all trans fats maybe 10 years ago. Um, are they just a byproduct or are they like an attention? Like it, was, it was easier to make them. It was cheaper to make them in a lab. You could make trans fats really easily. Um, and they were see, they were like CFCs. They were seen as a wonder product because hey, it, it's unsaturated, so it has less calories, but it tastes just like butter. It's perfect. We're gonna cook everything in trans fats um, because why not? Well, eventually we found why not. All right. So now we use hydrogen. If you're hydrogenating things, though, it doesn't really matter. If you if we made those synthetic trans fats and then we took the trans fats and hydrogenated them, then it's just a saturated fat. That's fine. Well, I mean, as fine as saturated fats are, um, fine in moderation. There's not really any need or reason to do that, though, because there are no natural sources of trans fats. You have to work to make them in the first place. So this process, the hydrogenation, is really as simple as. You take, take an alkene and you take hydrogen. And as long as you have a catalyst, you just add a hydrogen to both sides. So, and the mechanism for this is a little bit picky because we only get syn addition. So on a fatty acid chain, it doesn't matter because we're dealing with all tetrahedral carbons, no ring structures. Um, but if there are any ring structures involved, so in this case, we would get these two enantiomers, we would get none of the trans enantiomer, enantiomers, which when we see the mechanism, it makes a lot of sense. This one's actually, we're gonna look at the mechanisms. This isn't the mechanism that usually gets tested on that much. It's a little bit of random, but it goes through the same basic process every time. Um, and in general, a lot of times when we have, anytime you have a catalyst that is a solid, you're going to have things happening on one side of the molecule preferentially, because only one side of our starting material is going to be able to interact with the surface at a time, right? We can't have a surface interact with top and bottom simultaneously. Assuming we're stuck in you know, three-dimensional space. I'm sure if you're in four-dimensional space, things get weird, but we'll, we'll ignore that for now. And you can ask Bruce about that. <laughs> and so the way that this works is they, they figured out pretty early on um, that if that hydrogen gas sticks to the surface of certain metals, particularly heavy metals, um, platinum is sort of the gold standard. This is basically the same reasoning, same reason that, that um, platinum is used in catalytic converters is because if you have platinum surface and then you bring hydrogen gas down onto it or a lot of small gases, you'll break the bonds between the gas molecules and they'll, they call it adsorption. Um, so not absorption, they call it adsorption because I guess they're, because it adds to the surface rather than being moving into the surface. Um, that's the sort of question that I probably should have asked. I took a whole graduate level chemistry class on surface science. And we talked about adsorption and add layers and monolayers and things like that for a whole semester. Um, 
And I never once thought to ask why it's called adsorption versus ab absorption. But either way, when the, you get this adsorption happening, instead of having H2, you wind up with these random hydrogen atoms stuck to the surface, but they're not stuck all that strongly. And so what happens is anything with extra electrons can wind up doing that. And so our alkene winds up doing that too. You wind up making this temporary bond between a carbon and a platinum atom. Um, and that temporary bond leaves room for one of these hydrogen atoms to stick to the other end of what was the pi bond. And then in sort of a random process, it, um, you wind up eventually getting one of the other hydrogen atoms kind of moves over there too. That carbon hydrogen bond is more stable than the um, platinum hydrogen bond. So the hydrogens will stick here initially. So will your organic molecule, your pi bonds, and then eventually things stuff moves around on the surface, just like electrons can move through a metal pretty well. On the surface, these atoms are attached, but they can move around fairly freely because they just can just jump from one platinum atom to another. Um, they're all kind of identical. Kind of like forces keeping the hydrogens in the substrate to the platinum. Is it like a? So it's it's kind of like a weak covalent bond. So you you'll notice that these are both things that have elect that are electron rich, and the atoms are not electronegative. They're more electronegative than the platinum is. But you can't do this with oxygen. When oxygen does this, oxygen's so electronegative, it just oxidizes the surface and you get platinum oxide. But the hydrogens make kind of like a weak platinum bond, but they still are strong enough. They're strong enough to keep the electrons close to themselves, but not enough to make it a full ionic bond. Um, and so it's it's coulombic forces. If you if you really trace everything in chemistry back to it's if we're not talking about nuclear chemistry. And we're not talking, we're ignoring gravity. The only other force that there is is Coulombic forces, right? So really chemistry is really a very specialized branch of applied physics that just looks at electronic forces um, because we don't deal with any of the other three forces. Um, but yeah, it would, it's gonna be primarily the fact you've got these electrons that are somewhat attracted to the platinum, but they're not that attracted to the platinum. And the net result of this, if we actually trace oxidation states, when you break a pi bond between from carbon to carbon, does everybody remember doing oxidation states in Gen Chem? And very vaguely, we'll do a quick primer on this because this is a good this is a good digression because we we're going to redefine oxidation states for organic chemistry when we start talking about oxidation reduction reactions. So. Um, if we had, uh, we'll do an easy one. We'll just do an ionic one first. Al2O3. How do we decide what the oxidation state is on, on each of those? Close. So that's formal charge. Um, so in oxidation states, we basically treat um all covalent bonds as though they're ionic so we basically say okay whatever is most electronegative gets all the electrons they want first and whatever else is there is limited to make the charge add up to the same the net overall charge so oxygen needs two electrons to fill its valence right so we would look at this and say okay well if the oxygens are all negative two and there's three of them and the total molecule is zero What's the charge on, on the aluminums? Plus three. Right, so it's basic. So that for an ionic compound, it's as simple as just figuring out what the charge on everything is. For covalent compounds, it's a little bit weird. But we can look at, say, something like um, CO2 versus methane. So same process, most electronegative element first, 
figure out what the charge has to be on those. So oxygen's almost always going to be minus two. So the carbon has to be plus four. This is seeming familiar now. What about for methane? What's more electronegative? Carbon. So what's the oxidation state on carbon? Minus four. Which means all of the hydrogens are plus one. How about we'll do one more carbon based one? Just say what we do when, what do we do with something like formaldehyde? So usually with these, you still are going to start with the most electronegative and make it happy, but then we have, what do we do with the other ones in the middle, right? So if you start to your most electronegative, make it happy, and then you look at your hydrogens, they're the least electronegative, and you kind of work backward from there. But it actually gets a little bit easier now that we're in OCHEM, because we can look at all of the bonds individually. If we know what the overall structure is, we don't just need to look at the total oxidation states of everything. We can say, okay, well, oxygen's got two bonds with carbon and oxygen's more electronegative. So it gets all of those electrons. You've got hydrogen with carbon, carbon's more electronegative. So carbon gets all of those electrons. So that means each of these is plus one and plus one. So carbon lost two electrons to the oxygen, but it gained two electrons from the hydrogens. So the carbon, zero. Basically, yeah. So every, every carbon hydrogen bond, if, so now to put it in the perspective of what we do for organic chemistry, from the point of view of the carbons, since that's usually what we're going to care about, any carbon bond to something more electronegative is a plus one for the carbon. And any carbon hydrogen, carbon hydrogen bond is a minus one for the carbon. You just total up the bonds for the carbon. Right? So plus one, plus one, minus one, minus one, total is zero. And we kind of have to approach it from the point of view of, of every individual carbon, because if we have, what if we have something like, ethanol, those two carbons don't have the same oxidation state. So, the way we learned oxidation states in gen chem was just, oh, it's C2H6O. And we're just going to treat it like every carbon has the same oxidation state. And every hydrogen is the same oxidation state. Every oxygen is the same oxidation state. That doesn't really work. If you actually try to go through that same process in from gen chem for ethanol, you get with a non-integer number for carbon's oxidation states because they're not the same oxidation state. So from the point of view of this carbon, carbon gets the electrons from the hydrogen. So that's a minus three. And what do we do for the, what's a, what about a carbon-carbon bond? Yeah, it's perfectly neutral or perfectly matched, right? It's not perfect, perfect, but if we're rounding to integer values, we call a carbon-carbon bond is zero. So the carbon on the left has a minus three oxidation state. And the carbon on the right, you have two hydrogens. So that's minus one, minus two, 
a carbon bond that doesn't affect anything and an oxygen bond, which is plus one. Because it's only a single bond. So it's a minus one oxidation state for that carbon. So when we talk about oxidation reactions or, or reduction reactions from the point of view of carbon, oxidation reactions are almost always going to be we're adding more carbon oxygen bonds. Technically, adding any bonds to anything that's more electronegative than carbon, but oxygen is the most common culprit. Technically, adding a carbon-nitrogen bond is also oxidizing the carbon, or a carbon-chlorine bond, or a carbon-bromine bond. Oxidizing is taking an electron density away from Exactly. It. It's not changing the formal charge, because all of these carbons still have four pairs of electrons, right? So they still all have a full valence. But in terms of the oxidation state, it's changing that. Um, and that's why you see things like CO2 is ox or is carbon when it's it's most oxidized. It's a plus four charge. You can't get more oxidized than a plus four charge on carbon. And methane is fully reduced with a minus four charge. You can't get more reduced than minus four charge on a carbon. And that's why if you go to when you take biology classes, when they're talking about high energy carbons or high energy electrons. It's always high energy electron pairs are always going to be carbon hydrogen bonds or carbon carbon bonds because they can still be more fully oxidized by changing that for some for an oxygen. So energy, with respect to the energy, when you oxidize it, that like it releases energy from the bonds or how yeah, it's more downhill in energy to have more oxidized in on Earth because we have lots of oxygen present. If you don't have a lot of oxygen present, you don't have any way to do that. But yeah, it's an exothermic reaction to oxidize carbon. That's like how fats like store energy within those carbon hydrogen. Exactly, you make those big long fatty acid chains that are just all carbon hydrogen bonds, carbon carbon bonds, and then your body can go back later and chop off chunks of that and turn it into acetyl-CoA that it can feed into the citric acid cycle. All right, what does that have to do with whatever we were talking about? Well, the oxygen, we took carbon, a carbon-carbon bond and we turned it into carbon-hydrogen bonds. When you look at hydration reactions, you took a carbon-carbon bond and you took one, one carbon and added a hydrogen and one carbon and added an oxygen. Net result is that whole molecule didn't change oxidation states. Really, though, you reduced one of the carbons and you oxidized the carbon right next to it. Here, we're reducing both of the carbons. So we're actually giving more electron density to the carbons in this case. Net result, though, is that the hydrogen that was a hydrogen-hydrogen bond with an oxidation state of zero, the hydrogen goes from zero to plus one. So the hydrogens get oxidized, the carbons get reduced, the platinum stays more or less unchanged which is why it's the catalyst and why it's such an effective reaction. Um, it doesn't oxidize very well. Platinum's the gold, the gold standard. Um, it's, you wind up with using platinum for a lot of different catalytic processes because it doesn't oxidize very easily, even when exposed to oxygen or pretty harsh conditions. And it has the same property where it can, it can pretty gently break apart covalent bonds, sigma bonds, by giving it um, organic molecules uh, a place to adsorb and kind of, hope, you know, their extra electrons tend to stick to the platinums pretty well. So we see this a lot in organic chemistry. When in doubt, if you need to pick a, a metal catalyst for an organic reaction, start with platinum. Like, I noticed, like, going to San Francisco during COVID, they had these, like, uh, public restrooms. They had these, like, handles, and they're, like, it's a special, like, surface that's, like, antimicrobial. Is it something like that where, like, catalyzes? Um, it can be. I think typically, though, um, it's 
So a lot of times it's going to just be a coating on the surface that's plastic. It's like the, the brand name, I think, is Microband. You see it on dog dishes a lot, right? They'll say it Microband plastic dog dish, no bacterial will grow on it. A lot of times that's a plastic coating um, that basically just di disrupts cell membranes. Um, and so it's not necessarily that it's catalyzing any particular process. It could be a similar process to this. I mean, you don't see mold growing on metal surfaces. Um, you see oxidation happening, but you don't see mold growing. So it could be related to this, but I would have to look to be sure. Most cell membranes though are unsaturated fatty acid chains. Think of that phospholipid bilayer, right? The lipid part of that is mostly unsaturated fatty acid chains. And so if you have something that's going to allow those, those pi bonds to stick, you can't make a bilayer if the in middle of your bilayer layer is stuck to a surface. Um, so that could definitely play a role. It's going to be something similar, though. It disrupts some fundamental process of cells. Yeah, I've never seen that. I was like, what is I wonder what was going on. To... And I'd be curious to know if that affects protein or uh, viruses as well, because most viruses are protein coded. I think it was supposed to. What it was um, and so that would probably be something totally or similar idea, but different specifics in all likelihood. All right, let's take a break. Let's come back at 11 and we'll do some, we'll uh, talk a little bit more about hydrogenation and then we'll add halogenation to the list. I've always got one sick kid okay. continuously on rotation. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a rotation. I think I'll just apply them. <laughs> Platinum's the gold standard. It's gold anywhere in that standard? I guess not. I think gold oxidizes quicker. Yeah. So I think that was the main thing is that this platinum doesn't oxidize. It, oxygen's not getting in the way there. And why is gold like the first question? Gold for what? Surgery? For circuitry. Circuitry. Not a really good, really good conductor. Oh, maybe that's it. Because I think, because like copper is a good conductor, it's really malleable, and gold's like kind of soft. And so I think the softer, less brittle metals are better conductors generally. And like the more brittle ones are not as good. But I, I could be wrong. Yeah, no, you're right. It's a highly efficient conductor. <laughs> So mad at Kathy, I can hear it. <laughs> I, I totally thought I would have brought it up too. No, I just no. thought you were already in the room. No, with... no, I got here yesterday and I, I was like, rode my bike. So I was like, oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. My wife needed to drive a car. And I was yeah. like, I'll just ride my bike. And then um, got here and I didn't have my lock. So I had to like go back home and come back again. So yeah. it was like a half hour late yesterday. 
so oh, wait, that's the... yeah no what happened to you in the beginning of the class was uh kathy was like because you know how we went over like um kepler's laws and all that yeah. she was like we don't really need to know this so <laughs> she was like, yeah. Yeah. Like, she's so scatterbrained yeah and she was like if you guys want since we're behind we can skip this whole section and not learn about it oh, yeah. and then just move on i'm sure and matt was like no and then do like lab like the regular time yeah and then matt was like no it's astronomy we have to do it that's so mad. <laughs> That's a decision maker. Oh, Thanks, Matt. Sabotage. It's just physics. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, it's just because I have to go to, to Vegas for like a baby shower for like our goddaughter. And like, yeah, I know. And I'm like, oh, it's fine because like I'll. It's just I'll, a lecture. Yeah, it's yeah. just a lecture. I'll just get notes. And then she totally just switched all up yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, my gosh. So. <laughs> start this. this way it's less, last quarter started so strong. <laughs> it's like so opposite. I always do the worst on the third quarter. Yeah, I feel the same. What's that? It's like actually, less light. Yeah. Yeah. Less lights. Yeah. Like at WCC, you have like four. Classes all the time. I would probably just take winter yeah. quarter off. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. take, like replace it with the summer quarter. Mm -hmm. Me too. I wish, yeah, I wish it was like four equal quarters and you could do that. And like yeah. you sequence classes would be offered like every quarter, you know, instead of like you have to take, you know, 2 2 to chem 222, like yes. winter only. Yeah, you know? it'd be cool if we could do that and take winter off. I would probably have a master's degree by now. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Like at the whim of their whatever schedule. Yeah, well, I just like I don't know. Usually, the last eight years I've been working like at the ski resort, and then things get so busy in the winter, and yeah. I get so like exhausted, you know. Like by halfway through the winter quarter, I'm like uh, I like start dropping classes, and it's, it's been tough. Yeah, but now I don't have anything going on, so it's like. Are you still doing the internship? I finished that, so oh, okay. yeah, I had like a, a cap of like how long I could work there, you know. Because it's like a union, the union won't let like people work right. Okay. Like indefinitely not be part of the union. So. Were they trying to like get you in more permanently under like a certain like, specific contract or something? Yeah, he was trying to do different things. Um yeah, he was basically going to like the administrative from like, what can we do? Can we expand this? And then, so they, they extended my internship. It was only supposed to be three months, and then they made it six months, and then they're like, but then that like pushed against the like union regulations. Then right. there's no going against that, you'd have to Go create a new job and that takes like a year or two to do that. So, so maybe I can get the internship back though in the spring, possibly. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like you left in good standing if they wanted to yeah. expand it for you. It was really cool. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's like kind of my dream job. I felt like I found my calling and everything. Yeah. You know? no, I'm just like, then, but then it sucks to like, it's so cool to have that. And then you get kicked to the curb. You just like, yeah. Yeah. It's like fun. I want to go like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because yeah. I've been working so much up until now that I like get like I get like almost twenty bucks a week or something like that. Awesome. So I'd have to work like over three hours to like. Uh, you know, yeah. so you know, it doesn't make sense. You know, yeah, like, exactly. Ride that train until it stops. That's, I don't know, there's a lot of like forest service jobs and stuff. Have you done any like four service? No, it's like a service, yeah. Okay. But I've applied for different ones there. So I feel like you've been working in at the water treatment though. I was. I had an internship though. Yeah. And then, oh, okay. Yeah. Do you think you don't want a government job? No, I do. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
you know, under normal circumstances, normal administrations, those are pretty well protected, pretty stable. Yeah. You're going to get rich doing that, but yeah. Yeah. you get to spend a lot of time doing stuff you like. Exactly. It's, yeah, it's a nice uh, life standard and, and knowing like what your retirement is and just knowing that you have health insurance. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I definitely never want to run my own business and have to do with all the administrative stuff because then you don't get to focus on what your business is actually about. Right. Yeah, that's why you, you get a business major to go open a restaurant, right? Yeah, it's true. You know, I worked for a contractor and he's like, I don't study any of this stuff. I just study business. And he yeah, would like learn all the contract and stuff on the fly. Right, right. So I wasn't planning on spending a whole lot of time on hydrogenation um, just because it's, in a lot of respects, it's one of the simplest mechanisms. It's, we're not actually going to draw a whole lot in the way of, of electron bonds breaking and forming because it is kind of random and haphazard. You don't know what necessarily happens first. Um, but so it's the main thing to remember is just you're still just going to break a pi bond add a hydrogen to each side. And if there is any stereochemistry, um, it's only going to give you syn addition. So we can contrast that with halogenation, which doesn't require a catalyst. It doesn't require um, a surface. But it kind of makes sense because halogens are even more unstable, even more reactive than hydrogen is. Hydrogen is pretty reactive when you put it with oxygen gas um, or something electronegative. But in general, hydrogen's fairly stable on its own. Um, you know, there's a reason why as late as the 1920s, they thought it was a good idea to fill hot air balloons with hydrogen. Um, as long as you keep other oxidizing agents away from it, it is pretty stable. Hydrogen won't react with itself and it's not toxic. Um, and its mass is roughly half that of helium. So you could get a lot more lift you get twice as much lift from the same number of gas molecules if you used hydrogen instead of helium. Um, these days we understand that to be not a good idea because we don't build structures perfectly and things happen as structures age and get used. Um, the, you know, obviously the Hindenburg is the big, the big example there. Um, but even those still didn't carry that many people. Um, I've seen some proposals, not proposals, but sort of a near future sci-fi proposals for on earth as a way to mitigate um, the effects of flying planes to start replacing planes with slow moving blimps that could carry a plane worth of people um, and have almost no emissions. It could be, you know, you just have to have high helium in them and then run sort of photovoltaics um, to uh, power fans, basically propellers to push them around. It would be like taking a train from here to New York instead of a flight. So it'd be a couple days, but you could do it with virtually zero carbon emissions. Um, there's, a, there's an author named uh, Kim Stanley Robinson who lives in Davis, who's who he was famous for writing a series of books on, on terraforming Mars um, in the late eighties. Um, and despite, he has zero science background, a lot of like the classic, the um, classic sci-fi writers typically had come from science backgrounds like I, Isaac Asimov and, um, but uh, Kim Stanley Robinson doesn't have any of that. He's just learned all the science on the, on the fly. 
Um, he has some really interesting books he's written about Earth in the near future, like 50 years from now, 100 years from now, um, where he proposed things like that. It's neither here nor there. Um, but he's a really, really good author. And if you, um, he wrote a really good book on, on reasons why we can be, we could possibly mitigate climate change called Ministry for the Future. Um, that is very, the science is very well done. I'm picky about my sci-fi authors. The science has to be at least relatively well done. Um, anyway, halogenation is not, not as picky as, as hydrogenation because the halogens are more reactive and more electronegative. Um, and we typically only see it though with chlorine and bromine. Fluorine is too reactive, iodine is not reactive enough. Um, and it works with pretty good yields, chlorine in particular. If, so if chlorine is too reactive, iodine is not reactive enough, what can we expect about chlorine versus bromine? Which is going to be more reactive, better yields. You don't have the periodic table memorized yet? Yeah, chlor it goes fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. So um, chlorine gives us pretty good yields. We do have to work with the gas as a reactant, which we've talked about is less than ideal from a practical standpoint. Um, but we get, you know, 97% yield is pretty strong yield for, for an organic reaction. Um, we don't deal with anything with yields that high other than the, just straight up even that actually might even give combustion a run for its money, depending on what you're burning. Um, some combustion reactions don't even have a 97% yield. So that's pretty, works pretty well. It's a pretty good way for trying to add two halogens and ha adding two halogens can be helpful because halogens are really, really useful in terms of synthesis because it gives us sort of a target um, that we can uh, handle, that we can kind of move the molecule around with, right? Because we can do, if we have halogens, we can do elimination reactions, we can do substitution reactions. Um, that kind of gives us a lot of possibilities. Um, and plus, frankly, halogens, adding halogens to naturally occurring molecules is, is a really common way to discover new pharmaceuticals. Um, if you take you take a molecule that you know has physiological effects and you swap out, say, an oxygen for a chlorine, then it's going to be a different molecule, but it's going to fit pretty well into similar active sites in the body. Um, and so a lot of a lot of pharmaceuticals basically do that because you can effectively sort of slow down or speed up certain processes. Um, by introducing molecules that look a lot like something that's normally there, but aren't quite the same. Um, with bromine in particular, we only see the anti-addition. And chlorine as well. Um, and this is actually, so this tells us something about the mechanism as well. It's going to be something really similar to what we are what we already saw with, with the oxymercuration step. Bromine's a really big molecule, right? Has lots of electrons. Its orbitals can be moved around a lot because they're so big. Um, we wind up with an intermediate here that doesn't look like just our regular carbocation. And right, so, if we start with something like this, there's always going to be some, remember the um, London dispersion forces when you're talking about nonpolar molecules back in Gen Chem, how even nonpolar molecules have, can have temporary dipoles where they've got a slight, um, slight partial positive, slight partial negative, just because you think of these electrons as like water sloshing back and forth. Sometimes you get more electrons on one side than other. On average, they're even but there are moments where you get extra electrons on one side compared to the other. Um, and the more electrons something has, the more of those Van der Waals forces, more of those London dispersion forces we see. 
So bromine, Br2, has a lot of electrons compared to something like butene. Um, and so we can wind up with this bromine bond breaking to make a carbon bromine bond. Would this mechanism make sense with the whole, we only see anti-addition? The carbon cation would there would be no stereochemistry. Yeah, maybe slight stereo, maybe favor favor anti-addition a little bit just because the other one's going to stay away from the first bromine because yeah. it's big. Yeah. But we'd still expect to see some because we could have free rotation happening, right? And it could be attacked from either side. So it's with that in mind, it's a little bit more complicated than that because we should see at least some sin addition. What we actually wind up seeing is something that looks a lot like that mercurinium ion, is we get that nucleophilic attack loss of a leaving group step first, but then instead of making just one carbon bromine bond, we actually make two carbon bromine bonds. And we get this triangular intermediate, which also limits rearrangement, right? Just like with the with the oxymercuration, we don't see any rearrangement with the oxymercuration because the mercury did the same thing, right? Rather than making a full-on positive charge on a carbon and allowing it to rearrange, you made that that triangular. Uh, intermediate. And now it becomes really obvious why you can only have anti because this essentially is an SN2 attack, the second step. Right? And we know for a fact SN2 only does uh, attacks from the reverse side, from the anti side. Fun side note, my, my organic chemistry professor who was like 70 when I took his class. Um, when he was in grad school, he worked in the lab that proved this. Um, so, you know, it doesn't have his name on it or anything, but it's still kind of cool that, that uh, you know, I know a guy who knows a guy, so to speak. Last year we were learning stuff from hundreds of years ago now. Right. A few decades old. That's, yeah, and it's, it's in textbooks now. Um, he was also, he was a really colorful, Character. So he was in grad school at UC Santa Barbara in the 60s um, and uh, met his wife at UC Santa Barbara in the 60s. And he was fond of saying, you know, if you have a choice between getting tear gas or pepper spray, take the tear gas every time. Um, and he would never elaborate beyond that. <laughs> you talk about the chemical mechanisms. <laughs> um, so all that to say is when we do these halogenations, it's a simple two-step mechanism. The only trick, and it's one we've seen before, is that our intermediate is not a true carbocation. It's that three-sided ring structure. Chlorine, as chlorine's not as big, with chlorine, we do actually see a little bit of the sin product. We're gonna still see predominantly the anti-addition because of sterics. But with chlorine not having as many electrons, it can't make this three-sided ring structure nearly as well. So you don't get, it's not 100% the anti-addition. What's different about chlorine that it doesn't? So it's, it's um, higher in the periodic table, so it just doesn't have as many electron shells. It's smaller. And you need, physically, you need to be able to have big enough electron clouds that it can attach to both of these at once because that bromine's supposed to be tetrahedral. It's the size of its electrons. They overlap both of those orbitals. It can overlap at both at the same time. And they the larger your orbitals are, the sort of fuzzier they are, the less well-defined they are. which again is one of the reasons why you can't just do oxymercuration with something besides mercury, 
it's got to be something down in that towards the bottom of the periodic table um, because you need big enough orbitals to be able to force something that wants to be 109 degrees into something that's only 60 degrees ish, right? So that's not that stable. Um, and so you need those big fuzzy high end value orbitals. Um, these mechanisms to, we're going to add one more sort of wrinkle to it in that just the same way that with our, our hydration reactions, we could swap out water for different nucleophiles in various places. This second step, the nucleophilic attack, if we didn't use bromide as our nucleophile, we would get something else, right? Um, and so if we happen to have other nucleophiles present, then we get other, they're not quite function, new functional groups, um, but a, a halohydrin is when you wind up with a bromine or a halogen added to one side of a double bond and an OH added to the other side. So it's sort of like a cross between halogenation and hydration. You start with the same halogenation mechanism, make that three-sided ring structure, but then if water comes in as your nucleophile instead of the other bromine, you add an OH group. So if we're starting from a if our intermediate looks like, I'm going to try and draw it. I have a hydroxide coming in here and it's going to attack one of these two carbons. To make a new carbon oxygen bond and to break the carbon bromine bond, which one is going to be more attractive to the oxygen? More substituted or less substituted? Exactly. So we're not going to make a true carbocation, but remember that our carbocation rules for stability still apply to transition states too, because the transition state is still going to look like a, a little bit like a positive charge, right? If I clean this up a little bit. Where it's exactly. Yeah. So you, you have a partial bond forming to the oxygen, and you're starting to break this bond, but that means that there's sort of a bit of carbocation character, we call it. There's a partial positive on that carbon as the bond is breaking and new bond is forming. And so if we have to choose to put that on a primary carbon or a tertiary carbon, we're always going to put it on the tertiary carbon. And so the second step for these, so it's, and really it's the same logic as the oxymercuration too, um, the same net result. The second step adds to the more substituted carbon. Just in this case, we're not going to then go through another process where we remove the bromine um, be, like we did with the mercury. Mercury had that demercuration step at the end where you could remove the mercury, replace it with the hydrogen. Here, we're just going to be left with that halo hydrogen structure, which 
sounds like it could be a super villain Captain America movie. Um, and you can you can swap out that second nucleophile for pretty much any any other nucleophile that you want. So you just go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Would that uh, the hydroxyl would that compete with the other bromine ion? Too? Exactly. So it's gonna you're gonna get a ratio of products depending on what the relative nucleophile strengths are and what the concentrations are. If you have just a little bit of bromine in a whole bunch of water then a little bit of bromine isn't going to be enough to start making those, those structures. But, and, then, and then it becomes, okay, well, if I have five water molecules for every one bromide and water is a better nucleophile than bromide anyway, then we're going to get mostly the halohydrin product. But if we shifted that, if, if we are trying to only make the bromine product, but we had a little bit of water in our sample, just because water is an impurity, it's present in pretty much anything, even hydrophobic stuff has a little bit of water in it usually. Then we would wind up with this as a byproduct, um, this contaminating our, our actual product. So just like with everything else, you're gonna wind up with a whole bunch of, of different, um, a whole mess of products. It's a matter of minimizing the ones you don't want and maximizing the ones you do. If we wanted to make this product, there's almost no way of avoiding we're getting at some of the dibrominated product as well, because we have to have bromine present. So we're going to make bromide. It's just a matter of minimizing one versus the other, depending on where we're trying to go. Does it have to be like basic conditions to get the um, hydroxyl group? Not necessarily, because typically you're going to have. So I drew it as an OH group just because, but a water molecule is still a nucleophile, right? Um, so if you did it under under neutral conditions or even acidic conditions, you could still get um, that oxygen could still act as a nucleophile to some extent. You wouldn't want to do it under acidic conditions, but neutral is fine because water is a nucleophile. That just adds one more proton transfer step at the end, right? Um, whatever else happens to be around another water molecule or the bromide could act as a base. All right, and this is just going through the um, the same reaction or same mechanism we were just talking about, and same logic. We wind up putting our second nucleophile in the more substituted carbon because of that transition state, having carbocation character. All right. So the old textbook we used to use, and you'll, you see a lot of figures from it because I like a lot of the figures, even though we're using the OpenStax one. Um, I've already built my slides around the old textbook, so I'm still using a lot of those figures. Um, but a lot of the um, practice problems look like this. They say, okay, here's a molecule. And now it goes through all of these reactions, any of these reactions. What's the different product for each of these? Um, and I kind of went through and added the notes as to they're specific to each of these to remind us. Let's go through these. We have five different mechanisms shown here. What do we get for each of these mechanisms?
right, so let's start with our classic. HCl, first addition reaction we learned, right? Markovnikov, you get the syn and the anti. So with a ring structure where they're, we're going to get, um, where we can tell the difference between trans and, and cis, we're going to get a mixture of the trans and cis product. So we'll get... Oops, uh, we won't be able to tell the difference on this one. I take it back because it's Markovnikov. Doesn't matter that it's trans and cis in this case, does it? Because we'll get the chlorine and we'll get the methyl still attached, but it doesn't really matter which side of, of the ring is which, right? If it's if we go with the anti Markovnikov and it's the sin addition, we're only going to get the the sin addition means the chlorine or the sorry the OH group in this case and the hydrogen are added on the same side, which leaves the methyl trans relative to the OH. And bear in mind that that's going to, that creates two stereocenters, right? So they have to be trans relative to each other, but switching which one's up and which one's down gives us a different molecule. So we would have to specify, we'd get the R and the S, or even better is to just, and just not leave myself very much room on this slide. Uh, as, and just a reminder, as far as drawing the stereoisomers go, um, you could take the first molecule you drew and just draw it as a mirror image, because we would need to flip both stereocenters. Um, that would work. You could draw it like this, where you just, where you flip the two stereocenters, what was up was now down, vice versa. That works as well. Um, it's I tend to draw them so that I'm moving whatever the addition was rather than drawing the carbons. I find it easier to keep the carbons all where the carbons were and only draw my new substituents and change those from when I'm drawing the two. But it doesn't really matter if you had just drawn it um, reversed mirror image wise, um, that would be fine too. And hydroboration is gonna give us almost the same exact thing as our HCl, right? Doesn't matter what's up and what's down. It's Markovnikov, so we're adding to the more substituted carbon, we're just adding an OH. or the hydro hydrogenation is easy too, right? Get rid of that pi bond. The 
And the last one was the last thing we just added, right? That's our halohydrin formation. The OH is going to go on the more substituted carbon. So we had intermediate looks like this. Our oxygen is going to come in and attach. More substituted carbon. So you're going to wind up with the bromine in the methyl group on the same side of the ring. Methyl up, OH down, and then the enantiomer of that as well. Where you have the bromine down and the methyl down and the OH up. All right, give me one second to confer with my colleague. Back in a second. When I say colleague, I mean wife. Um, we might be trading off the kid right now. All right, so a couple more things we can add. These are um, we have a couple ways of adding, of creating what are called diols. And a diol is exactly what it sounds like, alcohol, twice. Okay. You're hitting up. You also have a few more minutes. Um, so with these diols, it gets a little bit weird. We actually have to start from, from a mechanism or a, a molecule that's not very stable. Um, and in fact, most time that you have peroxide bonds, um, they have a, typically have a pretty short shelf life, um, because they do wind up decomposing to make other gaseous products that can react with oxygen in the air. They, and they can get, um, you can wind up with them exploding. If you have an epoxide in a sealed container for an extended period of time, it's an explosion risk because pressure will build up. Um, and it also they also make lots of free radicals. So in this case, it's, it's a little bit similar what we're going to do here to what we saw with the, with the hydrogen peroxide, with the hydroboration, where having that oxygen-oxygen single bond means it's pretty unstable. Um, and when it's unstable, that means we can kind of move one oxygen at a time pretty easily. So, and in this case, we wind up making, it's technically an intermediate in this case, but it's actually its, its own end product. You can make these and they've got these epoxides will last a while if you keep them in an anoxic environment and away from, um, away from light. Um, that's actually what in, what epoxy is. Epoxy is the reason you mix two things together. You're actually doing an organic chemistry reaction. In one of those tubes is an epoxide. In the other side is a molecule that can break the epoxide group apart and link all the molecules together. So you actually, when you when you mix an epoxide or an epoxy together, when it sets, you actually get one giant molecule out of it. Everything's linked to everything else when it's fully all. Oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, it happens in a somewhat random way, 
Um, so it's not like you can say this is what the structure of your epoxy is going to be, but that's why you can shape it to kind of whatever you need it to be. And by changing the relative amounts, you get like the self-leveling epoxy versus like putty epoxy. Um, and, but it's the same general result. They're called epoxies because one of your components is an epoxide, which is these three-sided ring structures with oxygens. When you mix the epoxy resin together, it, it, uh, it's like exothermic because it usually gets hot. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be, so in like terms of this, this is like a, a you're putting it, the energy into this reaction then to make exactly. the oxide. Okay. Um, so, so this is, in well, this even this might still be downhill in energy slightly because um, these peroxy acids are pretty unstable on their own as well. Oh, okay, yeah. So it's it's not that hill, uphill in energy, even if it is the endothermic step might be making this in the first place. Okay. But and Frank, that the reason that's so exothermic is because of the ring strain. Remember, we talked about ring strain? Yeah. Breaking that three-sided ring strain. A carbon-oxygen bond's pretty stable. So the reason it's exothermic is because all of that force or all of that energy that's trapped um, in keeping these bonds 60 degrees from each other. It's cool. Yeah. It's cool that, like, sea lights that work with the popular. Um, it's, it's a really, really... Um, awesome product and it really is pretty safe if you know what you're doing with it and it lasts forever once you're done with it um, because you're making something that's that's so relatively stable. Or do you use it in aircraft uh, manufacturing? It wouldn't surprise me. It's, I mean, you use it in, like engineers use it. Have you ever heard of JB Weld? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, JB Weld is like a putty version that basically you can't actually weld with it, but it's almost, you make a bond between metal surfaces. It's almost as strong as if you welded them. Um, because it's, there's a lot of forces holding everything together. A lot of those covalent bonds are pretty strong. All right, the trickiest thing, this is a, a one-step reaction, really, um, but it's got a whole bunch of arrows happening in one step to make the epoxide in the first place. Um, I believe I'm blanking on what the name is. I think we call this a pericyclic reaction because you get all the electrons. You get really like four pairs of electrons moving simultaneously all in a cyclic direction. So you get one pair of electrons going counterclockwise, this pair of electrons going counterclockwise, that's going counterclockwise, that's going counterclockwise all at the same time. And the net result is you effectively have the hydrogen just goes through a rearrangement, basically. It gets shifted from one oxygen to this oxygen. But that breaks the pi bond here, so these electrons come over to make the pi bond again. And when these electrons come over to make the pi bond again, these electrons, so this oxygen now has a vacant spot, and the alkene electrons come over here, attached to the oxygen, and the last thing that's left is the, um, the oxygen-hydrogen bond electrons go with the oxygen because you have something, basically you have a proton transfer step happening within the same molecule. And so the transition state looks real wonky because you get all of these partial bonds breaking and forming simultaneously. Um, but the net result of all of those electrons sh shuffling around is you get the same acid that you started with. It's just not a peroxy acid anymore. It's just a regular carboxylic acid, but the same one you started with. Um, peroxyacetic acid is the most commonly used one because you just take acetic acid and if you put it in just the right environment, you can make it peroxyacetic acid. And then your product is just acetic acid and this epoxide. And the advantage to doing that, the reason this is so useful is because those epoxides are stable enough that you can store them use and use them later, purify them. Um, but they're not so stable 
that they're going to stay that way. All right, so the, the next step is then going through what's called an acid catalyzed ring opening. Which basically you're just going to turn that epoxide into an alcohol, but then you have to have something come in to do an SN2 reaction. So first step is you propane your epoxide. The next step is nucleophilic attack. A pair of electrons from something comes in here. And in theory, you could actually go through, it would kind of be, I'm not sure that there would be a reason to do this, um, but you could, this is a, make a, um, halohydrin backward by instead of attaching the bromine first and then bringing in the oxygen, you could attach the oxygen first and then bring in the bromide. But just you need something that's going to be able to do another nucleophilic attack. Most commonly, we see another oxygen. And then we do one more protein proton transfer. And now we have a diol. We have two alcohols attached where there was just a double bond. So it goes alkene to an epoxide in that one step electron transfer process. And then your epoxide goes through a ring opening reaction to give you an anti dial. Do you remember which book you got this uh, graphic from? Because it has better mechanisms than our textbook. Goes. Um, I believe we're using McMurray now, right? So it's Klein. Klein. Okay. I have a, I have a copy, and um, I definitely wouldn't wouldn't advise going and finding pirated PDFs on the internet. But the textbooks are really expensive. Yeah. Um, they cracked down on some of some of the sites where. I used to, I definitely don't recommend you go to this website here um, that totally does exactly what it says and gives you PDFs for free. That would be bad if you did that. Um, but the site that I usually would recommend, not recommend, um, has been uh, closed down right now. So I don't have anything off the top of my head, but there are PDFs floating around for Klein um, that have these. Because I agree, because I like these figures a lot. I like visual and I like the yeah the mechanism to search. Do you like them enough that you would have rather paid for for a client at the beginning? Maybe an old copy. Maybe an old copy. Yeah. Copy. That's that's what I try to balance, right? Yeah, right. This is a really great textbook, yeah. but there's 300 it. bucks. Yeah, I appreciate <laughs> All right, so that gives us the anti-dihydroxylation. So another way. So making a, adding a hydroxyl group is called a hydroxylation. Um, so a dihydroxylation is adding two OHs. Or if we go through this route, we always get the trans product. So what do you suppose the next mechanism is? If we don't want the trans product, we might want the, the cis product. Syn dihydroxylation uses a really toxic heavy metal, osmium, osmium eight oxide, um, is particularly nasty in biological systems. Don't wanna get that on your skin, um, but it's really, really helpful in that it can make um, an intermediate called an osmate ester, where you basically take your pi bond electrons and make new bonds to two of the oxygens. But think physically of what the, the space looks like here. It has to be on the same side of the ring structure, right? So this is going to be, give us our sin addition because the two new bonds we make, by the nature of both the oxygens are coming from the osmium at the same time, they have to be on the same side of the ring, same face of the ring. And then it's just a matter of going through a um, 
Uh, I believe this is a reduction process. No, you're going to oxidize the osmium. No, you're going to reduce the osmium because you're going to take the sulfite and turn it into sulfate. Um, so we're going to pull an oxygen away from the osmium, but that doesn't matter. You're going to wind up with osmium toxic waste, literally. Um, and but you pulled it off of your organic compound. And this is another case of, yeah, osmium's nasty, but we don't really have any better options because you know, every one of the heavy metals has its own unique sort of, you know, propensity to make these covalent bonds. And they're all slightly different strengths. So the reason we don't use osmium as a catalyst for hydrogenation is because maybe it makes bonds that are too strong for the hydrogen to be to detach easily. And the reason we don't use platinum here is because the bonds are too weak to be able to make this ester product, right? And so it's a lot of it has sort of been established empirically, just kind of guess and check. We know this works. We haven't found a better substitute for it. So this is still the standard that we use. Um, as various things get harder and harder to obtain, um, then that might change. You know, there's a limited, there's a finite amount of things like osmium on earth. Um, so we, you know, there's going, it's going to get more and more expensive as the natural sources are exhausted, um, which actually leads to, there's gonna be a really, really interesting field of, of um, maybe like post-consumer recycling where you, where companies are going to go into old landfills or old chemical waste storage sites and have to try and recover some of these things that were just buried in barrels for decades. Because well, what do you do when you've got this nasty soup full of like, you know, mercury acetate and osmium oxide and we can't use it for synthesis anymore and it's all mixed together in the sixties, nobody cared because they could just go get more for relatively cheap. Well, what do we do 50 years from now when we can't? We go back to the chemical waste sites and we go and we recover all that stuff. Um, that's going to be its whole, whole own industry in the future. In fact, we're already seeing that in Japan. Um, Japan has so much tech waste from the last 50 years that their landfills are actually being mined for precious metals. Um, in fact, when they, when they held the Olympics in Tokyo, was it Tokyo? Whatever the Japanese city there, they held them most recently. Oh, uh, it was the winter ones, right? No, uh, Nag Nag maybe I'm thinking it was more recent. I think there was, I thought there was one more recent. Either way, um, no, they did Summer Olympics in Tokyo, I think. There, there was one more recently, yeah. Um, I whatever the most recent one was, if it wasn't Tokyo, it was, it was close to Tokyo because it's not that large of a country. Um, all of their metals that they handed out were made from recycled gold, silver, and and material and copper that they mined out of their own landfills. Um, so with gold, silver, and copper, it's easy to see how that would be the case, but stuff like osmium and mercury, that's going to start happening too, I would say, sooner rather than later. All right. We're going to hold off on ozonolysis today, just because we have one minute left. And instead, I mentioned Isaac Asimov earlier. I'll give you one of my favorite factoids about Isaac Asimov. Do you know he was a biochem professor at Columbia? Um, he, uh, his, he grew up in the 30s and his dad, you know, typical overbearing Jewish father, um, told him he was gonna go to college and be a, and be a doctor. Um, so he majored in, in chemistry because he liked chemistry better than biology in undergrad and then applied for a PhD program instead of a medical doctor and told his dad, yeah, I'm going to be a doctor. <laughs> um, and his dad was not amused when he figured it out. <laughs> um, but he's actually one of the most prolific authors of all time. He wrote something like, if you averaged it out over the course of his entire adult life, he wrote something like 10 pages a day for 70 years. 
He wrote textbooks, he wrote popular science books, he wrote articles, he wrote short stories, he wrote sci-fi, you know, he wrote everything. Uh, and he is just, he was a biochemistry PhD before biochemistry was a field. He was a chemist studying biological systems with chemistry because that's what you called it in the 50s. You didn't call it biochemistry because there was, biochemistry wasn't a thing. Um, but we know him now as the guy who wrote the Will Smith movie, iRobot. <laughs> All right, we'll end there. And it was Tokyo. It was Tokyo? Okay. I, 2020. Yeah, but I think they said they actually did it. They did it in 2021. But it was supposed to be. Yeah, that's what I would Yeah, my, a, um, a guy I went to high school with, my dad coached um, on our water polo team, played water polo in the Tokyo Olympics. <laughs> Um, so he was really upset because he was afraid he was going to lose his, his spot on the team in an extra year. Cause he'd already, he already went to Rio. Um, so he was already old by, yeah. you know, by athlete standards. Short careers, yeah.